so today we're at the Georgia Tech Candida building, the Living Futures, Living Building Challenge. And this is one of the most, if not the most energy efficient building in the entire Southeast. Um, and it, comp it complies to the Living Futures, Living Building standard, which consists of seven pedals, four of which are tangible, such as place, location, materials, energy, and water and three of which are not tangible, such as beauty, equity, health, and happiness. Today we're going to be talking and focusing on the two predominant ones, which are water and energy, and how this building is truly net positive when it comes to both of those pedals. This building is truly a tour de force uh, for sustainable buildings in the entire Southeast. And it came to be a number of years ago with a collaboration of uh, architects, engineers, and so on, as well as Georgia Tech folks here. And this building was first thought to be not perhaps even feasible or possible due to the humidity and other issues here in the Southeast. But we are in living proof of this building all around us. Uh, my involvement was when I was with the School of Architecture in modeling the building, looking at the energy consumption. So we had developed a number of tools on campus in the High Performance Building Lab as, um, as directed by Professor Gottfried Algenbro at the time and now by Dr. Tarek Raka in looking at any type of building and doing modeling to see just how energy efficient it would be. Looking at thermal envelope, looking at the site, looking at solar, looking at temperature, uh, schedules, etc., etc. And so we did that and found the EUI of this building to be quite remarkable, at least on paper, before it was even constructed at around 34 uh, uh, BTU, I believe, BTU per uh, foot squared per year. Armed with that in mind, we then consulted with a number of folks to see how could we make a truly energy efficient envelope as well as look at the solar production. So one part of, an integral part of the living building challenge is non-combustion generation. And in fact, solar is what would do that as we will be looking at, there's a 330 kilowatt solar array on this building. So the building was anticipated to consume around 350 megawatt hours of energy per year, complying to around 34 uh, BTU per, KBTU rather, per foot squared per year. And in order to be net positive, it was deemed that a 330 kilowatt PV array could do that, producing over 450 megawatt uh, hours of energy per year. And so, I was then commissioned by a local solar contractor as an electrical engineer, uh, in addition, which I am, in order to design the entire PV array and part of the electrical room, which we'll be looking at shortly as well. Um, so all in all, this is truly a net positive building that is deemed to be net positive by 40% for the first year, but in fact also five years, hence 10 years and 15 years and so on. Uh, it came into commission in around um, beginning of uh, 2020, a year that is truly in the memory of all of us right now. And uh, after one year of completion and actual operation, it will be granted the Living Futures Certificate, that which I believe is indeed in the works right now, certification. So we're here underneath the solar canopy of the Candida building, the Georgia Tech Candida building. It is a 330 kilowatt PV array consisting of some of the most efficient solar modules out there called SunPower. These 22% efficiency modules pretty much comprise the bulk of all the energy, in fact, all the energy production in the building, uh, creating a net positive by 40%. So three hundred uh, over a thousand modules uh, consisting of these uh, highly efficient uh, solar array, uh, solar modules at 22%, uh, are some of the best in the market. Uh, they have one of the best temperature coefficients out there, plus their degradation per year is less, considerably less than the standard module, thus ensuring that this building is net positive, not only in the first year, but also year after year after year for a full 20 years, in fact. We're in the dungeon, or rather the basement of the building right here, 
and uh, we will be talking about the electrical room and how this is the, the hub, the grand central station for all electrical uh, uh, conduit and work here in the building. Uh, just a recap, this is a multifunctional building that consists of three, uh, two lab classrooms and three standard classrooms and is used all throughout the campus for, uh, used for members throughout the campus for many different purposes uh, as well. Uh, for, uh, it also consists of a 200 person auditorium uh, for events and a maker space as well. So uh, 34,000 square foot building, two stories plus the basement. Uh, as a multifunctional building. So behind me is the electrical room and this is where the electrical action happens and as an electrical engineer this is where I have some of my most fun of course as well. Uh, to my left is the switchboard, the switch gear, which is essentially responsible for making sure that all circuits in the building are well protected. Safety is always number one in electrical systems, and all the breakers and everything are within this very elaborate switch gear. Completely behind me, against the far wall, is the battery system. And that battery system is not a tremendously large one, uh, but it is used to make sure that if uh, all power is lost to the building, that the building can do some basic minimal functions, so like some lighting and emergency stuff as well. To my right is the PV system and the control panel board. By PV system, what I really mean is that this is where the main disconnect of the PV array for the inverters in the roof, uh, which are associated with the PV modules that convert from DC to AC, and the transformer that converts into electrical power that's usable for the building itself, the 2083 phase. And of particular interest is the Schneider Electric uh, uh, control system that you can see right here. What's showing is the PV array. Right now we can see around 38 uh, kilowatts of power being generated. It is a very, very cloudy and rainy day, so you can expect only maybe around 10 to 20 percent of production from that full 330 kilowatt array. Uh, even with that, you can see in terms of total building load, just to the left of that, the building is currently consuming 30 kilowatts, yet it is producing 36 kilowatts. So even with that, for the time being, it is net positive. But certainly throughout the year, the building will be net positive. And you can see it's a 208 volt system. The first number on the top, it would, would be anywhere from 208 to 210 volts. The second number right below that is the current being used in the building, the three-phase current. And finally, the very last number in each of these little um, displays is the kilowatt, both the generation and the consumption, total building consumption, but also divided per each of the uh, regions of the building, from mechanical room, lighting, battery uh, plug loads, elevator, computer services, uh, maker space, and so on. Um, and there is also an elaborate dashboard that one can log on and see what the building is doing at any one point as well. So this is where the electrical magic of the building happens. And as we can see, um, metrics are very important. All metrics are on display for anybody to see at any one time. This is a truly remarkable building. There's much to uh, talk about. Uh, the 50,000 gallon cistern, the biodigester, the composting, the water reclamator, the HVAC system, and so on. So if you'd like to learn more about any of that, please do go to the uh, Candida Building uh, Georgia Tech website, and you'll see all of that outlined in uh, full elaborate uh, explanations given there.